all the recording information will be um, online on my website uh, www.downs.ca slash presentation slash 533 and I see also that the conference is recording this zoom session as well so we've got both so let's launch into it and you've probably noticed it's been a challenging year uh, it's uh, we've got you know the the usual crises plus a little bit of extra today uh, we've got climate change of course we've got democracy in crisis and I do note for the record that this presentation is happening the day of the 2020 presidential election in the United States we don't know what's gonna happen yet so we're all interested or some of us are uh, we have ongoing problems in Canada the US and around the world with poverty and inequality we have issues with social media disinformation fake news um, oh yes and we have a global pandemic happening um, which means that everybody or not everybody but many people are working at home I am working at home this is my my personal home office as you can see uh, especially cleaned up for this presentation um, and of course we have the economic crisis uh, and we're probably just at the beginning of that so it's a pretty interesting time in the world today I'm gonna structure my presentation today around the current work that I'm doing and I know you're probably not necessarily interested in the current work that I'm doing but uh, this work touches on many of the themes that I think are prevalent in the world of online learning and new media today so we'll begin with some of the stuff that I've done for my COVID response and then look at some projects that I'm involved in extended reality training data literacy and then some off the side of the desk if you will research that I've been doing on ethics and analytics and of course as always personal learning environments so we begin with the COVID response and uh, you know just in case you're curious inside NRC now of course we've shifted to working at home like everyone else uh, to make this work we've had to greatly expand our virtual uh, private network uh, capacity uh, buying a bunch of extra bandwidth and seat licenses we adopted zoom meetings and I'm getting kind of good at working with zoom meetings uh, we set up slack for quick messaging uh, longer term we're probably going to move all of this to Microsoft teams but you don't migrate an enterprise like NRC to Microsoft teams on the turn of a dime so we're using these other things and we have faced issues the same sorts of issues that schools are facing around the world issues with cloud services making sure we're secure while working at a distance uh, migrating our processes to an online environment and then thinking about the long-term impact of this and there will be a long-term impact I for one don't intend to go back to the office if I can possibly avoid it so the COVID response really is framed around the different types of educational technology that are available everything from uh, tools for experiential learning all the way down to tools for software simulation workflow transactional and so on and uh, now what I did to begin with uh, to adapt to COVID is I began by creating something called a quick tech guide because the idea here was that enterprise technology isn't going to change on a dime people needed quick tools in a hurry to make things work so that's what I did so if we go to that uh, very quickly to take a look at it we have to scroll down here it is bitly quick tech guide so here it is 
This basically on the left hand side is a listing of pretty much all the different types of educational technology that you would ever need. And what I've done in this guide is provided links for people, for individuals to create any of these things using free tools. Uh, and oh, there's a bunch of people on it already. Um, so everything from calendar to teams to screen and video recording, etc. Uh, wow. <laughs> it's nice to see that everybody's able to just zip into this like this right away. That's wonderful. Um, when, um, when I first started it, I left it open for anybody to edit. And so I had a fair amount of time that I had to spend fixing the edits. Um, but it became really popular in a hurry. Um, you know, the first few days of the pandemic, popularity waned off a bit. But I'm still accepting submissions. There are all these options. And if you don't like my guide, who says you have to, right? There's a long list of other guides at the bottom. And if you send me yours, I'll add it to the list. So that was the first thing, basically, that I did for uh, the COVID response is the quick tech guide. And as I say, it needed the tech I added needed to be tech-based or web-based, free and open access, uh, etc. Um, as well, uh, I'm looking at the longer term impact here. Um, you know, maybe I should expand this guide, include pedagogy, etc. Not really sure at this point in time. Another part of the COVID response, uh, thinking about MOOCs, uh, a lot of people turned to MOOCs and, you know, it's, it's almost like this year has become the resurgence of the MOOC. These are a few resources that I've put together on MOOCs over the years, uh, including the true history of the MOOC, which was, of course, developed by us in 2008. And then Tony Bates wrote a pretty good article distinguishing between the C MOOC and the X MOOC. Now, I haven't run a MOOC over this COVID um, pandemic, but a lot of other people have. And, and so I haven't felt the need to, although I'm probably looking at running one or two, well, I was going to say maybe in the fall, but it's November. So sometime, uh, sometime in the future. Uh, I've also worked with uh, some other bodies on the COVID response, including a, a group put together by the International Science Council called COVID-EA. Um, that stands for, uh, stands for something. Um, uh, oh yeah, COVID Education Alliance. Uh, we've just released something called a COVID EA primer, or if you're British, you say primer. Uh, that's just a, a rough, quick draft of the sorts of things that we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about what it's going to take to get people to the point to move to online learning um, and which is what we're going to have to do in this current COVID environment. So moving forward, you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of issues that the COVID epidemic has, uh, the COVID pandemic has brought to us. Uh, what kind of education are we looking at providing? Competencies? Um, you know, there's the, this whole story about the competency model of education, but there are issues with that model. Uh, issues around, are we providing the proper sort of education if we're focusing only on competencies and not on a lot of, I won't say soft skills, but uh, along the lines of the more social benefits that are created by an education, especially, you know, an education in an institution like Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Yale. Uh, they're not focused on competencies. They're focused on building networks. They're focused on creating social skills, giving people the practical experience they need to navigate in the academic and business world, things like that. 
questions of the evidence for learning. There's been a, uh, a controversy around um, an exam proctoring service called Proctorio. Um, you know, what sort of evidence do we provide for learning? I did a presentation recently, there's a link in this slide or two, um, on open recognition networks. Uh, what about micro learning? What about course libraries? A lot of libraries during the pandemic had to, you know, change uh, change their systems on the fly uh, in order to provide access to people who weren't on the university campus. So now the second type of project that I've been involved in is an immersive reality project. Um, it's the name keeps changing, but right now it's XRT for TEAM. I'm not going to figure out what that stands for, but basically, um, it's extended reality XT, um, for teams. I mean, in particular for emergency, uh, emergency response teams. Now we're looking at what immersive reality is. Uh, is it just the VR helmet? Uh, what are the key elements of immersion? Uh, does it include games or should it focus on serious learning? So looking at our particular presentation, oops, uh, our particular presentation, um, we're looking at uh, virtual reality mostly, but you know, there is the choice extended reality or augmented reality and virtual reality. Two major platforms to consider, Unity and Unreal. Now Unity was originally released for the Mac OS and it's a pretty popular virtual reality platform, but there's also the Unreal Engine and it's from Epic Games. Now you might recall Epic Games is the company that is currently engaged in a lawsuit with Apple uh, about the 30% uh, surcharge that Apple levies on anything that is uh, offered on the Apple or the iOS platform. Uh, this battle isn't just about app stores. Um, this battle is about the future of virtual reality and whether Apple gets a 30% cut basically from all of virtual reality. Um, and it's a serious issue. Um, so I think there's more to this battle between Epic and, and Apple than we're seeing in the news headlines. Right now, the big stopper for uh, virtual reality is the cost of the hardware. Uh, three of the major choices, uh, HTC Vive, 1.3 thousand, um, in other words, $1,300. The HoloLens from Microsoft, super expensive. Uh, you can get an Oculus headset for much less. The problem with the Oculus headset is you have to also get a Facebook account. So I think there's a gap still between where we are and, and virtual reality actually hitting education in a big way. But these prices are going to come down, I think, in fairly short order. So anyhow, we're doing extended reality training for transportation emergencies and management. We've doing, been doing a bit of background research on this now. We've got some people developing the, uh, the actual simulations. I'm not doing the hands-on on that um, because I don't have a headset. Um, but uh, I've been doing some background research on it and putting together the advisory group, which we've put together of people in the sector from across Canada. And here are a few links on this page to extended reality training for emergency management. Emergency management is a little outside my own area of expertise, but it's still pretty interesting. And I got to go to the fire building at NRC where they deliberately set things on fire. And that was pretty cool. So what really makes extended reality work is presence. I did a, a presentation on presence uh, a month or two ago, looking at models of presence like the community of inquiry model from Anderson, Archer, 
in garrison. Uh, also surveyed some other kinds of presence, uh, you know, interface, learning autonomy, etc. Presence really is the idea that there's somebody at the other end of the system. Um, if I'm succeeding with presence here today, what you should be getting is the feeling that I'm human, uh, I'm doing stuff, I'm doing stuff live on the fly, um, I'm conveying not just information, uh, but maybe a sense of, of my interest in the subject, my excitement about the subject, etc. Uh, that's, you know, and if we think about other kinds of presence, uh, you know, for, for example, uh, interface, learning, autonomy, cognitive, social, etc., these are different aspects, different ways of me projecting myself into the environment where you are. And I've thought about it. And to me, what makes the difference in presence and what will make the difference in extended reality isn't the technology, it's belief. Does the person using the tool believe that they're there? Do they think it's real? Uh, are they willing to engage? So it's very much a perceptual question rather than a technology question. So I found that pretty interesting. Another big project that we're working on is on data literacy. Uh, it seems like a bit of a jump from the other stuff, but it's not. I mean, if we go back to the crises that we've been looking at, fake news, democracy and crisis and all of that, plus all of the complications that have been brought to us by the pandemic and the difficulties, you know, even in things like having a meeting online, things like data literacy move to the fore. I've done and, and will be presenting in another forum uh, a fair amount of background work here in data literacy. I would break it down into four major data literacy models, clip and save, uh, data stewardship, science and research, information literacy, and analytics and decision making. And what these are, these are four frames or four ways of thinking about data literacy. For example, data stewardship is, um, do you know how to manage your data? Do you have a source of truth for your data? Do you know how to integrate multiple source of data, sources of data into a data lake? Do you know how to organize that data into an application specific data mart, stuff like that. Um, there are also different measurement frameworks for assessing data literacy. Uh, most of what's out there now is self-assessment, which is eh, not that useful, right? Um, as well, uh, there's a distinction to be drawn, a useful one, I think, between uh, individual and collective data literacy. And then because we're working in a practical context, uh, data literacy isn't this thing that's abstract out there in the world. Uh, we need a mechanism for mapping what we think data literacy is to what we think the benefits are that are realized from it. Um, you know, it might be as simple as uh, saving money or not being fooled. Um, or in our context, uh, we're looking at operational advantages, right? Being better than the other people who are in the same field. So anyhow, I've compiled a bunch of stuff and I continue to add to this. Uh, you can view that um, as soon as it loads here. Uh, Again, it's a Google Doc, and so here are all of my notes, the different types of data literacy, etc. I put on the PowerPoint slide a couple of key references, but uh, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of stuff you can read on data literacy. So if you're interested in this subject, this might be a starting point for you. and. Uh, 
if you're interested in data literacy and have a resource that you haven't found, please send it to me. I'll add it to this list. I'll add the summary to the summary. And uh, when I produce the overall report on what I think data literacy is and how to go about teaching it, uh, you'll be able to access it there in that copy. So uh, I don't know when that'll be done, but uh, it's sometime uh, in the next few months, probably maybe sooner. So watch for it. Uh, it's such an important topic and uh, it is new. I mean, work began really and seriously on it in say 2010. Well, the earliest references, significant references are 2008. Um, but 2010 is kind of when it all came together. So moving on from data literacy, uh, oh, right, I do want to mention the challenges to learning providers that data literacy, the whole question poses. Um, learning providers today are asking whether they should focus on content knowledge versus literacies, not just reading and writing, but what I call critical literacies, which would include critical thinking, the capacity to explain, uh, the ability to sort real from false uh, information, and even things like uh, identifying value systems, identifying what you want to value, etc. They're also looking at the distinction between employment skills versus education. That, that's a key issue today. People are always talking about, well, education should be providing job skills. The problem is the job skills that are relevant today aren't the job skills that will be relevant when they graduate. We've seen in our world of crisis how society can change on a dime. And we need to be able to develop ways for people to be resilient, to be able to learn how to learn. And that means focusing on what I'll call here education. Uh, we're also looking at major social change inside and outside of education. Uh, do we rely on authority or can we look at the wisdom of crowds, properly so called? Uh, you know, this is, you know, the distinction between do we learn from experts or do we learn uh, for ourselves with the support of experts? And of course, the question of credentials, again, comes up in this area. This is basically my approach to data literacy, my approach to critical literacies generally. Uh, the major critical literacies, syntax, semantics, context, use, cognition, and change. Then the skills that are needed in working in a data environment, aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. And then the semantic side of that, the values, uh, what makes a data network work most effectively, autonomy, diversity, openness, interaction. If you've listened to or seen any of my stuff at all in the past, you've probably seen me hit on some of these subjects in my various talks. The next major subject is ethics, analytics, and duty of care. Now, one of the things that I did there is uh, a presentation on open recognition networks. Uh, that was just a few days ago. and. Uh, the uh, audio and video and all of that are available for you on the web. Uh, see how this is part of data literacy, right? Uh, you know, uh, instead of just doing a presentation and letting it disappear into the ether, I collect the slides, the audio, the video. I use Google to make uh, an automated transcript. I use the Google Nexus phone. Um, and I provide a link back to the conference. So when I said this presentation will be available at presentation slash 533, well, here's the site right now because the presentation hasn't happened yet. 
but uh, in a day or two, um, all of this stuff will be available on this, this website and you'll be able to access it. That's data management, but that's also adapting how you're doing what you're doing to the online world. I sincerely hope that I'm still broadcasting. My uh, thing is saying no internet access. Uh, I am good, so my computer is lying to me. <laughs> so there's a little example of data literacy for you, right on the fly. <laughs> okay, um, so um, also on ethics, analytics, and duty of care, um, I've been getting involved a little bit in uh, committees and councils related to this subject. I've joined a government-wide um, artificial intelligence policy community of practice. Um, and actually, I'll be working on a subcommittee in that on uh, best practices for AI in education. So if you have ideas on that, send them to me. Uh, this is the GC Colab link. Now, that's, GC Colab is a public-facing website but it's not wide open so um i'm not sure if you will be able to get access to it you know speaking to you as an individual rather than generally generally if you're an academic or if you work in government you can access it um but each individual case is different also internally at nrc uh, I'm on a data equity working group. Uh, I also did a thing recently, I don't have a link to it, looking at ethical codes um, and research ethics boards, and I'm looking at joining the research ethics board for the NRC. That should be a lot of fun, um, actually. I know not everybody thinks of something like that as fun, but I think of something like that as fun. Um, the main bit about ethics, analytics, and duty of care for me uh, is the, uh, I was, well, I did a presentation, then I started writing a paper, and it grew. So here's the Google Docs version of it. Um, this is page one. <laughs> um, so there, there are, I, I've looked at, applications of AI in education, issues, ethical codes, and then beginning with ethical approaches and through the rest of it, uh, I have notes. This is gradually being converted into a book, which I'm hosting on press books. So I actually have real text for, like I say, the first uh, third to a half of it, I have text, and then the rest of it is my notes in progress. Um, I think you'll find it already interesting. Uh, if you have suggestions or ideas uh, about things that I should consider, I'm all ears. And again, of course, the results of this will be made uh, freely and openly available. Um, as a service to the community. I think of this as the world's most boring book. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not writing this for marketability or sales or anything like that. I'm writing this for comprehensiveness uh, and, and accuracy. So, for example, when I talk about the applications of analytics and learning, I'm talking about all of the applications of analytics and learning. I'm not picking and choosing. I'm capturing everything with examples so you can get a complete picture of it. Similarly with the issues, right? I'm not highlighting this, that, or the other issue. I'm identifying all of them. That's what makes it so boring, but I think that's also what makes it useful. At least I hope that's what makes it useful. This has been a big part of my work. Um, over the last year, it'll continue to occupy my time and my interest because I think, you know, we need this broad based look. Again, we go back to all of the issues in our society, the pandemic, 
the information uh, issues, the democracy issues, we as a society need to get a handle on the ethical approaches to um, artificial intelligence and other technologies, and especially how we talk about them and how we teach them. And here's my conclusion from the work that I've done so far, still tentative, but um, I just read a thing today from Jeffrey Hinton, the father of AI, saying eventually deep learning is going to do everything. Uh, there aren't any gaps that is that aren't going to be done by deep learning, right? There aren't any jobs, there aren't any super creative jobs that only humans can do. We like to think that, but deep learning works the same way brains work, which means they're eventually going to do all this work. So what is there for us to do? Our job in the future, our only job in the future will to be teachers, to teach artificial intelligence. That means we have to get our act together in the sense that we have to figure out, you know, not by voting, but figure out what values, what principles, what processes we want to teach artificial intelligence. And we have to instantiate them in ourselves because otherwise we'll never be able to teach the AI. You know, the issues that come up in AI, bias and prejudice and, and bad predictions and all of that, we can see those in the population as a whole, right? So we need to fix these in ourselves before we can ever fix them in AI because we are the ones teaching AI and that will be our job. So we have to get it right. Anyhow, I'm looking forward to finishing this. Even if it's a boring book, it might be relevant and useful. It's, in cer it's certainly possible. Last thing is personal learning environments. Um, a few years ago, I ran a MOOC called eLearning 3.0. Um, that's still available on the website. Um, oh, that's right. I can't click there. I have to click there. Um, and uh, here it is. Um, and it covers some of the major trends in e-learning, not the ones that are happening now that other futurists like Horizon Report will predict, but the stuff that's coming that will impact us really in a big way in five to ten years. I broke them down into data cloud graph, identity, resources, recognition, community, experience, and agency. Wrote a little essay for each and talked about in some presentations, especially later, the big idea from each of these things. There's a lot of stuff in there. There's no way to summarize it at this point in time. But this content I'm finding is still re relevant even to this day. The other thing that I'm doing with respect to uh, personal learning environments is I'm continuing to work on uh, distributed social networks, um, you know, things like Opry Unite, Mozilla, OS, Diaspora, these have passed by the wayside. Solid, which is Tim Berners-Lee's project, continues to be important. Uh, but I noticed just yesterday, Mitzi Laszlo, uh, their manager, said that she's moving on. So I'm, I wonder about that project. Um, I'm still interested in interplanetary file system. I'm still very interested in Mastodon, the Fediverse generally, and something called Activity Pub. Um, if you want to learn about the, as they call it, the feder, Fediverse or Federated Networks, this website is a really comprehensive website. It covers everything for you. The other thing I'm doing is something called Grasshopper in a Box. And what I've done is I've taken my Grasshopper application and, sorry about that, um, Oh, didn't click. Let's try that again. Could not locate internet server or proxy server. Maybe now I'm not broadcasting. Uh, but I'm still recording. And I'm going to record for the last three minutes, no matter what. Um, 
Yeah, I think I might be okay. Uh, I'm still broadcasting. All right, thanks for the chat support. I don't know why it didn't, why the uh, grasshopper link didn't show up, but oh well, I don't have time to fuss with it, so I won't. Um, anyhow, on that website is a link to a Docker container so that with just one or two commands, um, you can actually get an instance of Grasshopper running in uh, a virtual container on your own desktop. It should run on any desktop. Now, it's not perfect. I'm still working on it, but it gives it's the first real chance for people who are not programming experts to get a sense of what I'm trying to do with Grasshopper. And I'm going to continue developing this idea and this concept. Um, cloud infrastructures in general are pretty important for this. Like, like I say, I'm using Docker. I've done it in the past using Vagrant. Didn't go as well as I wanted to. Uh, Vagrant and Grasshopper resulted in me never being invited back to Online Educa Berlin. So that tells you something. Um, the thing that containerization does for you is it provides you access to a whole bunch of cloud services. Wolfram Alpha, MS Cognitive, basic AI services, uh, automated translation, all of that sort of thing. So my view of the personal learning environment is you get one of these containers. It has Grasshopper in it. Grasshopper accesses the cloud storage the distributed data networks, and these uh, cloud services that you can use in order to work with your own data. Aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. That's what Grasshopper is intended to support. It's your personal answer to fake news, the information crisis, the crisis in democracy, global warming, and all the rest of it. Um, personal learning environments, again, here's the concept. All of this different information comes in, you manage it, and then you broadcast it to wherever you want. That's also where data literacy comes in, right? So, you know, it's, it's interesting, this position that I'm working in, it's not about the technology all the time. Yeah, you got to know the technology, but it's so often about critical literacy, about perception, sense of belief. Uh, it's so often about, you know, uh, how people see things, what their environment is, what their ways of perceiving things are, how they're going to learn. Uh, you know, the technology, you can't dismiss the technology and it's a two-way kind of thing. You, know, you don't plan pedagogy, then do technology. It goes back and forth because the technology let you do stuff you were never able to do w before uh, the technology came. So some of the things that I've been looking at, repository networks, personal cloud, personal learning record, personal learning assistance, probably powered by AI that we have to teach, <laughs> um, and distributed intelligence. You know, we're facing a lot of challenges in our educational institutions. Uh, with this economic crisis coming, the bottom's going to fall out of the financial support governments provide. We, yeah, as a people, to have to adapt. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the very last slide. So we, we're looking at these challenges. We're looking at what we need to go forward. We can't depend on the institutions to do it. We have to do it for ourselves. Thank you. All done. Parfait. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Stephen. Donc, maintenant, on va passer à Monsieur Thierry. Thank you very much, Mr. Doss. Um, so, uh, bonjour. Alors, ma présentation se, sera en français. Je, je vais partager mon écran si j'en ai la permission. Alors, je 
bonjour. Euh, ça fait drôle de, de parler à, à un très style euh, que j'ai vu à plusieurs reprises, j'ai la chance de voir à plusieurs reprises. Je vais vous parler de, de compétences numériques pour l'enseignement et l'apprentissage au poste secondaire. Euh, je vais tenter de rendre les diapositives disponibles en ligne peu de temps aussi après la, la conférence. Euh, j'ai structuré ma présentation en six moments. Euh, dire quelques mots sur le contexte actuel de la formation postsecondaire, dire quelques mots sur les recherches aussi actuelles euh, qu'on qu qu retrouve en lien avec le, le contexte exceptionnel de la crise sanitaire de l'enseignement et l'apprentissage à l'université, dire quelques mots sur une recherche aussi que j'ai menée avec certains collègues et euh, parler ensuite de ça, des, des compétences numériques et plus précisément d'une compétence numérique, une politique ministérielle qui est quand même beaucoup moins connue au poste secondaire et qui mériterait d'être euh, mieux connue. Et c'est l'essentiel le, de mon propos portera justement sur cette politique et sur, euh, sur comment on peut, comment finalement c'est les compétences ou les, les différentes facettes de cette compétence qui sont énoncées dans cette politique peuvent particulièrement servir dans le contexte actuel. Euh, je parlerai, j'essaierai de conclure ensuite de ça sur les quelles compétences numériques pour les enseignants et garder un tout petit peu de temps pour des échanges et des questions. Euh, dans, dans le contexte actuel, on parle de contexte actuel de, depuis mars dernier, euh, une crise sanitaire sans précédent. Euh, selon le, le site de l'UNESCO, c'est plus de 2 milliards d'apprenants qui ont vu leur établissement d'enseignement fermé depuis mars dernier. Euh, certains rouvrent, certains referment. Et donc, euh, réellement, on a, on, on a euh, un contexte tout à fait exceptionnel actuellement. Et, euh, et donc, la formation à distance, c'est devenu de plus en plus une norme. Euh, et ce qui, est, ce qui est réellement intéressant quand on y pense, euh, surtout à, avec les collègues avec qui je collabore depuis longtemps, qui, qui, qui travaillent en, en formation à distance, est-ce qu'on peut réellement euh, pas poser encore, quand on fait des 